botnet malware talks to it, uh, we send out reports you know, directly, um, and those are you know, all provided for free to the providers. Uh, so what we see, and I take a look at that, is you know, cloud in some respects is no different than a lot of the other you know, dedicated servers, Colo, uh, a person running a web server under their desk. We're seeing an abuse, uh, pretty much anyone and everyone on this panel um, and the other providers, they're, they're popping up as being the source of DDoS attacks, they're being attacked themselves, um, and we're also seeing them host, whether it's either through compromised or fraudulent signups with stolen credit cards from talking to some of the providers, we know that. Um, they're being used for you know spamming, phishing, um, to launch attacks because they're the command and control server uh, to steal keylog data. Uh, we're, we're pretty much seeing cloud being abused you know, quite a bit. Uh, you know, it goes both ways. As heard earlier, it's you know the fraud and then also people that aren't you know patching their server or whatever reason they were able to uh, break in through a weak password or something along those lines. Michael, Microsoft's perspective. So. Um, <clears throat> Microsoft, we, we provide services in the different layers of the cloud service deployment that, we, that we've talked about CSA before. So we're doing software as a service and platform as a service. So we happen to see a pretty good cross-section of, of, of types of abuse. For example, our Windows Live service is a consumer-facing service that does um, you know, Windows Live Spaces and SkyDrive. And so what we see is the predictable things there is uh, people misusing those in violation of our acceptable use policy. Uh, to store things like malware or images that are unacceptable for a variety of reasons. And uh, so that's what you would expect normally in that sort of scenario. And, you know, I would echo uh, what Steve said earlier, which is in our platform as a service, you know, we've, we also um, have that respect for privacy um, and we have a standard set of network controls that, that let us see uh, stuff like network traffic that, that is, is aberrant or statistically anomalous that would then let us hone in on abuse such as um, you know, a botnet control channel or a spam relay or something like that. So pretty consistent with what the other panelists have said. Alex, Facebook? Sorry. Standard abuse abuse channels that, that you would expect if, if someone from Mortified if this if this stuff you know, needed to come up. Yeah, this is it. I think that's also trying to work around the problem in a slightly shady way. Like they're uh, essentially trusting you while the data is in transit as well, not just when it's at rest on the server. Uh, the uh, the, the Facebook approach to that is a little similar to what uh, Mike was talking about, which is uh, we don't proactively scan everything that's out there. We rely on users to report data to us, and there's a lot of different forms that that takes, but that's the key starting point is let, let other people tell you that it's bad, and then you're responding to a complaint rather than proactively invading someone's <laughs> privacy. So as, as far as the uh, different types of abuse that uh, we see in the cloud, uh, Facebook isn't a, a platform as a service. It's uh, very much a closer to software as a service. What we're essentially providing is users of data hosted in the cloud. And that changes the attack threat quite a bit as you're now able to, when you, when you get access to cloud provider, I'm still tripping up trying to call Facebook a cloud provider. I don't really get consider it a cloud provider, but that's uh, essentially what it is. You inherit the persona of that person, whether it's their VM image or their Facebook profile or their Gmail account in a way that isn't really possible when it's hosted in your own environment. And the, the attacks that we see on Facebook are really evolving from old style attacks that now can get a lot trickier when can't really tell who it is that you're communicating with. Um, even though the, the 
IP space looks like it's coming from Amazon, people are pretty quickly realizing that there are known properties on Amazon that aren't Amazon. And in the, uh, the attack scenarios that come out of that look a lot different. When you take the Facebook scenario, oh no, Facebook account is compromised, it's not clear that it's an attacker. It's the individual identity that is taken for at that point. And the uh, attacks look quite different. They're a lot scarier than they are when it's just someone's uh, email that the account has. Just a follow-up question on the abuse. How many, uh, or can you give me an idea of the volume of complaints you get from people whose accounts you have shut down, instances, accounts, services, whatever, that actually you thought were doing something uh, nefarious but actually were not? Is there a sense of volume? Does this happen a lot? Is it once in a blue I would blue say moon? The, the vast majority, of the, at least in our cases, it's activity that took place where the user didn't realize that other activity was taking place. Uh, the account's compromised and it was doing something that it shouldn't be doing, sending spam or soliciting money from people or uploading images that are used for spam somewhere else. And the, the tricky part there is communicating to the end user what activity was actually taking place that caused us to take action. Uh, we obviously have false positives, but I feel like it's a, it's a much smaller percentage when compared to users who were actually performing malicious behavior but just didn't realize it. And the, the challenge is telling them that uh, they were really screwing up. Yeah, I would agree agree with that completely. Um, it, it definitely falls into those two camps. There's either a user who's been compromised and may or may not know it, and then our action actually triggers their awareness of, you know, you've, you've had a problem here, and so we would cover the count for them, or the other bucket is the, is the, the folks that are doing it intentionally and maliciously, and we don't tend to hear complaints from them <laughs> when, <laughs> when their, uh, their accounts are deactivated for violating, you know, state, internet, le local, state, and federal laws or whatever yeah. it is that they're doing. Um, and I don't have the exact statistics, but um, um, I think it's, I, I would echo that it's, it's a small number of, of folks who, who complain about, you know, a false positive that we've had. Yeah. I mean, to me, it's certainly an interesting dynamic because the, le the, the what is the law? The, you know, it's almost like each provider has their own law. That, that they've come up with, that whether it's an acceptable use policy or, or something around how you can use their service. They're, sure, there's local things that you, you can go after in, in kind of in borderless things, you know, child pornography, you know, key loggers, uh, banking, et cetera, but there's also kind of these little almost uh, different aspects that everyone treats differently. You know, Facebook's idea of abuse, I'm guessing, is quite a bit different than Amazon's, um, et cetera. So it's, to me, that's a very interesting dynamic. Um, but the next question really is around um, one of the interesting aspects, and someone was touching about this earlier in a presentation, is that a lot of vendors have basically taken security products and called them cloud in some way. Um, so there's obviously people that deliver services in the cloud um, as, as a delivery mechanism, security as a service, but then there's people that are actually doing actual security for the cloud, um, not in the cloud. Um, so really, uh, what, what I find particularly interesting is that in order to develop a security product that fits all of these clouds is, is damn near impossible because they all are glued together differently. Um, as much as we'd like to think, they're, uh, maybe they all have web services, but you have to be very intimately knowledgeable about each platform. So the question really is, uh, do you believe we're moving from a product security world to a platform security world where vendors or people participate within your security have to have deeper knowledge about what exactly is going on? Or do you think there's going to be kind of off the shelf continued, you know, the AV for the cloud or virtualization for the cloud or firewalls for the cloud um, as we have today? Why don't we start off with you? Um, yeah, from a, a few of the vendors that I've talked to, um, I mean, we've actually <clears throat> had to come in and, and do NDAs and uh, kind of really go over architecture, some of the pieces as we've talked about deploying certain things places and, you know, I'll get done kind of giving them a, a high level overview and drawing it on the whiteboard and they'll, you know, they're just kind of left like in this, you know, uh, deer in the headlight kind of gaze. Um, 
you know, when you when you get done, and then it's like, okay, guys, you know, they start they start talking about how they're going to have to, you know, redo how they talk between different devices and how they scale between devices and scale horizontally because um, they don't have any one single device uh, that you can put in place or there's software uh, running on one one server. You can't deploy a server big enough for their software to handle the the volume. Uh, so. And, and then even in how do you tie it into um, our kind of processes, if it's something that uh, you would say want to give a customer access to, um, their product doesn't have the idea of APIs, it has the idea of a control panel or a management you know, panel that, um, you know, if we were using it just for strictly for our purposes, um, you know, would be fine, you know, our, our network guys would be using it, but if you want to deploy it um, to customers and let them management, manage it if they, you know, if they choose to, um, there, there's no way to do that currently, so it's a it's a total rearchitecture of their products and stuff. And um, it would be great if we we were moving towards the securing the platform because it'd make a lot of things that um, easier. Um, but I I don't know that all of the all the vendors are, are on board with that. Yet. Well, it's a challenging I, I business a, conundrum, right? Because yes. the margins are, are clearly not as good in <laughs> services yes. as they are in uh, yes. so hardware I, or software. From from the from the stuff I've looked at, that's kind of um, yeah. they they like the idea. Once you sit down, um, they get excited, and and their guys start talking about how they, how they could make that happen. But no nobody's yeah. quite there quite there yet. How about from Amazon's perspective? I know I've I've heard. Uh, um, the CTO Werner talk about how Amazon minus security doesn't use really any, there's really no products out there within the AWS infrastructure that are designed for, for how you guys do. So you guys have a lot of homegrown or a lot of modified stuff. How about in security? Well, yeah, Werner's right. Um, there, there is a, there's a fair amount of, um, of, of secret sauce, right? A lot of the stuff that uh, we've put together, we, we've engineered ourselves. Uh, you know, the, the security group functionality, for, for example. Um, we do have, we, we do rely on certain internal procedures and technologies for safeguarding our infrastructure uh, from external attack, as well as you know trying to minimize pathways from one customer to another. I guess, as far as thinking about you know moving to product or, or, or platform security, what what I like, what what I like about the way our offering is structured is that. Um, a customer could bring whatever security product they want and use it. Sort of as I, you know, introduced that fourth inspection tier in my talk earlier today. Um, I, I don't want to be in a position where I dictate to a customer that they have to use brand X IDS or brand Y web application firewall. I'd much rather let them be able to use whichever one they want works best for their needs. And and the way we built our service, that is completely distinct from uh, whatever tools and technologies we use to protect the infrastructure. Okay. Stephen, from the shadow server standpoint, what, what's your thoughts on, so what, one, of the, um, one of the risks that we had earlier um, that Michael outlined was around the unknown. How do you secure the unknown? Um, because uh, quite frankly, people don't know necessarily what firewall they're behind, what IDS they're behind. What, what if there's a vulnerability within the stack that they're installing? Well, what are some of your views on that or, or the I mean, subject? You're giving me the, the question about how to secure the unknown. That's a, that's a <laughs> terrible question to give me. No, uh, so yeah, um, I, I guess they, you know, people, you know, it goes into a few different aspects. So if you're trying to tackle one problem, you need to go about it. You know, I don't know if we're talking about someone who's just using the cloud or we're talking about the cloud provider. And you said some of these people, it's up to the customer. So how are they trying, what are they trying to solve exactly? If they're trying to 